Greetings, my dear friend. Marital infidelity. Behind these words are personal tragedy, broken hearts, a lot of negative emotions in our time. I think there are no people who have not faced it. The hero of today's story becomes a victim of his own wife's love affair. It would seem that cheaters should go unpunished, but the events do not develop in the way they want. Will the hero of this story be able to get out of a difficult situation as a winner? Let's listen and find out. And while you are watching this video, my dear viewer, put your most powerful like and subscribe to the channel if you haven't done it yet. Let's go. Have you talked to your ex since the divorce? Brooke asked one of the women at the table, taking a sip of wine from her beaded glass. A group of ladies enjoyed relaxing on the terrace of the Traveler's Inn Hotel. Brooke paused before replying, No, since I kicked him out of the house and filed for divorce with a restraining order, I don't know anything else about him. He tried to talk to the children, but after I explained the situation to them, they chose to ignore him. Ellie, who was new to the group, asked curiously, Was it hard to break up? It seems that there is still pain in the air. When did the divorce happen? It's been a year. This Cretan has been dragging his feet with the divorce for a whole year. As soon as he realized that the children didn't want anything to do with him, he finally gave up, signed the papers, and left. But in fact, he hasn't been with us for two years. Good luck to him, Brooks said bitterly. Ellie's next question was inevitable. Why did you decide to take such a step? Divorced him, you mean? Because he betrayed me with his first love, Gemma Evans. Suddenly, voices rang out from behind. Has Jake Van Dam cheated? Someone asked. It can't be, was the reply. He's not capable of that. And as for cheating with me, I would remember that. It's impossible, absolutely impossible. You must be playing one of your devious games again, Mrs. Brooke Pack, the girl said, and Brooke turned her head so quickly that the audience thought her eyes would pop out. Well, 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 look who decided to show up. You've got a lot of nerve. Look at her, who's talking? Brooke grumbled. You started controlling Jake when we were still a couple. Your deception led to our breakup, and you still have the audacity to accuse Jake of cheating on you with me? Gemma asked incredulously. That was two years ago, as you well know. If Brooke's words could have caused physical harm, they would have caused Gemma to bleed. It can't be. If I had an intimacy with Jake, I would definitely remember, wouldn't I? Two years ago, I studied general linguistics and studied with international students in Edinburgh, Scotland. I can confirm this with more certainty than you can your current location. I recently returned for a week after a three-year stay abroad, and before that I worked as a teacher at a secondary school on the opposite side of the country. Brooke paled at the revelation. She had not expected such an outcome, and this news was disastrous for her. If it wasn't Miss Evans, then who was he cheating with? When I found out that he cheated on me, I immediately kicked him out, Brooke demanded, feeling like a traitor. Gemma intervened. By publicly shaming him, you have ensured that he could no longer stay here. I think even his own parents were deceived by your actions. Personally, I think he wasn't fooled at all, but just came under your influence. Are these kids really his? I could ask, but I have to go. I have important things to do, including talking to Jake's parents. Brooke's face paled again. Don't you dare! I'll make sure you regret it. Gemma stared icily at the woman she once thought was beautiful. Grinning, she noticed. Life has definitely not been kind to you, has it? You wear makeup too often to look even half attractive. And try not to let your hair down, otherwise resin may get on it. Despite the harsh words, Gemma understood that she had to do her duty. I have to visit your former relatives and tell them that I have an alibi in case of treason, she said coldly. With that, she turned to leave, taking one last look back before disappearing through the exit. Thank you for divorcing him. As soon as I find him, he will be mine. As for your threat, it is absurd. I'm leaving for a new job tomorrow and will never return to this toxic environment. With these parting words, Gemma headed to her car and drove straight to the Van Damme mansion. The elegant house looked exactly as she remembered it. Three parking spaces at the gate, 
and two towering ginkgo biloba trees planted by Jake's great-grandparents. There were tall trees on the driveway leading to the house, giving cool shade. Gemma parked the car, and taking her laptop from the trunk, climbed the three wide granite steps to the front door. She went to the door and knocked politely. The door swung open, and Jake's grandfather stood in front of her. Yes, dear lady? he asked. Good afternoon, Mr. Van Dam. I'm Gemma Evans. Do you remember me? It's been a long time. Yes, yes, I remember you, he replied with a smile. Wasn't your name mentioned in connection with the question of Jake's marriage? Grandpa asked. Gemma nodded, confirming that she had indeed been mentioned. I can assure you, sir, that Jake and I did not have an affair. I have proof that I was in Edinburgh at the time. Rufus Sr. stared at Gemma intently, making her feel that her innermost thoughts were open to him. After a moment of silence, he spoke again, his eyes flashing. Call me Rufus. Older. It's amazing and brave of you. My son and daughter-in-law think it's all Jake's fault, but I don't agree with that. I don't think he's capable of that. Why are you trying to clear his name? Gemma felt that this man would easily recognize a lie and would be embarrassed to lie, so she confessed honestly. Jake doesn't understand yet, but I plan to marry him. But first I need to find him. Do you know where he is, Mr. Van Dam? The old man's eyes twinkled slyly as he replied, He doesn't keep in touch with his family, but I can tell that he is currently in St. Christopher's Crossing, working at the university. But I must say that you are a wonderful woman. Let's keep this between us. And I have another secret that I want to share with you. I accepted a job offer at the university where he works, so I know I'll see him. A voice came from the back of the house. Father, who is there? The old man grinned and asked Gemma if she knew where the kitchen was. Gemma nodded without turning around and almost bumped into Jake's mother. How brazen you are! Stop it! She screamed. You ruined my son's marriage and now you come here uninvited. Get out! Jake's grandfather quickly intervened and exclaimed, Anna, she's my guest and I'll listen to what she has to say. She claims that she was not in the country at the time of this scandalous event. Anna Van Dam's demeanor immediately changed, and she looked at Gemma in disbelief. What? I find it hard to believe, she replied. Gemma calmly took the laptop, smiled at the older man, and said, I can prove it to you. An hour later, Gemma found herself in the face of a distraught mother and an angry old man. What should I do now? She wondered. Gemma made the decision to be honest again. I do not know what to do. Jake and I quickly became close, became real friends, at least as close as possible. But everything changed when Brooke came along. Gemma shared with Brooke the heartbreaking story of the loss of a close friend and soulmate, without delving into her suspicions about an unexpected pregnancy. Now Jake had to reveal the truth, if, of course, he could be found. Anna was shocked by the manipulative actions of the woman who is the mother of her grandchildren and decided that Jack also needed to meet this woman. Would you like to have dinner with us, honey? Anna asked softly. And please tell Randall the story of your grief, she added. Gemma politely declined, explaining that she needed to prepare for a new job. She did not inform Anna of her whereabouts. Anna cast a brief glance to the side, saying goodbye to Gemma. If you find Jake, please let us know. I think we offended him and made the wrong choice. I really want my youngest son back, Anna said. Gemma replied in a calm tone. If or better yet, when I find him, I'll give you a message. But I cannot report his whereabouts, as it is not in my power. Jake disappeared for a specific purpose and obviously he doesn't want to be discovered. With that, she headed for her car. When she reached the halfway point, a man caught her attention. Oh no, Jake's brother, she thought. Watching the man, she noticed his advanced age and increased weight. His gait resembled that of a gorilla. At first glance, he fit the description. His cheeks were rough, his neck thick, his shoulders broad, and his arms were spread wide 
as if he couldn't bring them parallel to his body. His noticeable belly bulged, his steps were shallow, and his thick upper thighs rubbed against each other as he wheezed, like an old steam locomotive. Rufus Van Dam studied the slender, dark-haired woman. She looked familiar to him, but he couldn't pinpoint her location. He thought she could use a big chest. I wish they'd hug me, he thought, entering the house and bumping into his grandfather. Do we have a guest? Rufus asked his grandfather, noticing a figure approaching the gate. Rufus Sr. replied with a straight face, Yes, this is an old friend of Jake's who wants to establish a relationship. Unfortunately, we don't have his real address. Annoyed, Rufus muttered, This lying little man! I have to keep acting! I have to deal with him in every sense! Climbing the stairs, he entered his specially designed apartment, created for him after an accident in the house. Meanwhile, Brooke was deep in thought about her life. The divorce took place when Jacob, also known as Jake, was 35 years old, just two years younger than her. Their children, born within a year of each other, were already 16 and 15 years old. Their paths did not cross immediately. Brooke first noticed the 18-year-old boy when he finished swimming. At first, she completely ignored him, not even bothering to look at him. But when a dark-haired girl came up to him and began to help him get out of his wetsuit, she couldn't help but pay attention to him. She suddenly found him stunningly attractive. She watched the couple closely, studying the guy's facial features. When the girl dried him with a towel and he raised his arms, she couldn't help but notice how his muscles tensed. After finding out that Jake had the toned physique of a swimmer with powerful muscles hidden under a small layer of fat, she was determined to get him. She began to strategize how to make it a reality ignoring the fact that he most likely has a girlfriend. It took Brooke six months to break down Jake's walls of shyness. Fortunately, the situation became more favorable when Jake's potential girlfriend decided to move, and it became easier for Brooke to manipulate the situation in her favor. Jake invited Brooke to meet his family at the monthly family barbecue. As she found out, he was the youngest of three children and appeared in the family late. When she finally met them at a barbecue, Brooke was struck by the similarity of the two brothers, the same height, the same hair color, and almost identical faces, but the differences were striking. Brother Rufus was superior to Jake. He was built like a brick house, with large bulging muscles, while Jake was more elegantly built and had no noticeable muscle mass. If Jake was distinguished by a calm and measured manner of speech, then his brother Rufus was the complete opposite, noisy, energetic, and focused on superficial communication. Rufus considered himself the smartest of them all and despised his brother. Therefore, he drew attention to an attractive girl among them, deciding to show her more care and affection. It took Rufus a lot of effort, including two weeks of gifts and constant attention, to finally get Brooke into a decent hotel. A month later, Brooke began to realize that she had missed her period. When she plucked up the courage to ask Rufus about it, he just laughed in her face and cruelly told her that she should have taken the pills. Up to this point, Brooke had only dated her first boyfriend and Rufus, but after Rufus dealt with her, she decided she deserved better and started dating Jake. Three months later, Jake and Brooke tied the knot in a small ceremony, and Brooke has been over the moon ever since. She had a devoted husband who cared deeply for her, but also had a reckless lover on the side. Jake was skilled in bed and provided for her, while her lover was just a quick fling for casual encounters. Rufus lacked size, and his efforts were forgetful and did not leave a lasting impression. She did not pay attention to the fact that she did not always reach the climax, finding a high in secret from everyone. Just 13 years later, Rufus's rampant lifestyle caught up with him and led to a series of troubles. The abundant and relentless use of substances that improve muscle mass eventually made itself felt, and the consequences turned out to be very serious. Everything collapsed when Rufus lost consciousness in the gym, but fortunately there was a nurse nearby who immediately rushed into battle and took life-saving measures before the ambulance arrived. Upon arrival at the hospital, 
Doctors quickly diagnosed his myocardial rupture, attributing it to prolonged and excessive use of anabolic steroids. He was immediately operated on and discharged from the hospital with a completely changed body. The muscular body he once had has now been replaced by flabbiness and poor physical condition. It became obvious that he would need constant and long-term care. As the months passed, he began to mentor Brooke, criticize Jake, and convince her to demand more financial stability from him. He posed as a victim, exaggerating his difficulties and insisting that Brooke deserved better treatment. Over time, his influence began to take its toll. Brooke's attitude towards Jake began to change, but not in a positive way. She began to belittle him and find flaws in him. At first, even minor household irritants were enough to trigger Brooke's negative behavior. In the end, she insisted on buying her own car, as she did not want to be associated with the old junk that they had. Brooke didn't seem to notice how her actions affected Jake. It was obvious that she had never pushed him to this extent before. She faltered when Jake suddenly left in the middle of her long speech. The children came running, asking when their father would stop his harsh remarks. Come back, she screamed. I'm not done with you yet. But Jake simply retreated to his cramped office, closing the door behind him and turning on his laptop. A minute later, Brooke came into the room. Jake looked at her and gave her a stern order. Go away, right now. After almost 15 years of marriage, Brooke finally realized that Jake had reached a turning point. She'd always thought he could take punches, but now she saw that he was actually the kind of person who kept things to himself until they stopped. It was a revelation to her that Jake only lost his temper when he was pushed to the extreme. She saw the pain in his eyes as he stared into the abyss she had created in his soul and realized that she had gone too far. Jake had reached his limit and had to defend himself. Jake had always been sure that Rufus would be the one to run the family business. The company flourished by supplying the aviation industry with first-class parts designed to ensure the safety of aircraft operating at a high level. Jake, who received a doctorate in aeronautics and a master's degree in industrial design, was preparing to become a future director of technology, as his grandfather wanted. But everything changed when his father seized control of the company and pushed Jake into the background. Although he suspected his brother was involved, Jake was not concerned about this turn of events. He was already overwhelmed with work. When his father fired him for a formal reason, he tried to get him to sign a document prohibiting him from working for a competitor. But Jake only laughed in his face and sang the words of the song, I am free, and freedom tastes like reality. When he left home, he was approached by a major competitor with an offer that he could not refuse. Resolutely seizing this opportunity, he worked 28 hours a week, received the same salary as when he was full-time at his father's company, but with much better benefits. Jake had long assumed that his father and brother would try to oust him, so he followed his grandfather's advice and founded his own company in Luxembourg. All his freelance work went through this company, and most of his income went to an offshore internet account in one of the European tax havens. Jake never revealed the source of the extra money coming into his regular account, but Brooke assumed he was taking on extra work to earn it. She didn't ask this question, as it made their financial situation more comfortable. In the end, Jake decided to transfer all the money to an offshore account so that his freelance work would be separated from his regular income. He was not going to give up part-time jobs because they were necessary for him to sign contracts and ensure financial stability. But he realized that he needed to pay more attention to communicating with children and reduce the length of the working day. The next morning, Jake was sitting at the kitchen table, watching the news on his tablet and sipping his usual coffee. Brooke came into the room and asked, Where have you been all night? I've been waiting for you. Jake replied, Only about five minutes before falling asleep. Don't be so cynical. Brooke insisted, Tell me everything. Before I leave, I want to say a few words to you. Brooke bit back a sarcastic reply on the tip of her tongue. Instead, she calmly replied, The word is yours. 
Jake spoke in a tired and disappointed tone. I've been working non-stop for several days in a row to meet your demands. I sacrificed time with our children and my own well-being, but now it's over. I've reduced my workload and set boundaries. If you want more, you have to contribute too. After a short silence, he raised his hand as Brooke began to speak. I'm not done, he interrupted. Your attitude towards me is unacceptable, and if this continues, we may have to consider a divorce. The decision is yours, and I'm leaving, and for once I'll have a breakfast that I didn't have to cook myself. With that, Jake left the kitchen before Brooke could respond. She sat in shock, staring at the closed door. She had never seen Jake like this before. She took out her cell phone and dialed Rufus's number. Rufus, Jake is being stubborn again. I'm at a loss how to deal with him, she said with a sigh. Rufus chuckled. I saw it coming. I have a backup plan. Meanwhile, Jake was sitting at his desk when his secretary informed him that he had an unexpected visitor. Perplexed, he asked if there were any meetings scheduled for that day that he did not know about. No, sir, but she says it's very urgent, the receptionist replied. Then an elderly woman came into the office and asked to introduce herself. Handing him two sealed envelopes, she said, I regret to inform you that you have already received a summons. Shaking her head, the woman left the office, telling the secretary to keep an eye on him and noting how terrible the news was. Jake stared at the envelopes, feeling a strange sense of relief wash over him. Finally, everything will be completed. He had foreseen this moment, but the pain was still unbearable. What he did not expect was that the envelope contained a restraining order prohibiting him from contacting his wife, children, and parents. What really surprised him was the officially signed document confirming his relationship with Gemma Evans. It caused him deep pain. He began to perform the necessary procedures, Naturally, his bank accounts were frozen. He found out from his colleagues if there was a lawyer among them to whom he could turn. But unfortunately, there were none. But one of the clients, faced with a similar situation, recommended his lawyer to Jake. As a result, he rented a modest apartment. Now he has to return to the present moment. Brooke overheard Olivia and Brian talking quietly. Although their voices were low, Brooke could still make out that her son seemed to want to share the problem with his father. Curious, she intervened and suggested, Why don't you talk to Uncle Rufus about this if you have a problem? Olivia replied sarcastically, doubting the wisdom of seeking advice from a man she considered a sweaty fat jerk. Brooke was shocked and offended by Olivia's disrespectful comment. She clenched her jaw to keep from revealing her father's true identity. Wait. Is he your uncle? Brooke asked incredulously. Yes, but not the best uncle, she admitted. He offered me terrible things. The daughter looked at her with disgust and said, And that's not what he asked for. Brooke couldn't believe it. It was his own daughter, she thought. If what she says is true, then God help us all. That evening, many skeletons were removed from the closet. Brooke couldn't ignore the disturbing truth that Rufus was a threat to her and her children. Even though nothing bad had happened so far, she saw him as a potential danger. The only reason her children were confident and able to stand up to Rufus was the self-esteem that Jake instilled in them. The real problem was Brooke's impending dependence on Rufus in terms of financial support and lifestyle. Jake paid significant alimony, ensuring their comfortable situation. But soon, everything was going to change. Brooke found herself in a difficult position and regretted some of the decisions she had made. Nice to meet you, Leonard Daltrey, Gemma Evans greeted him with a smile. I've heard a lot of good things about you and I'm looking forward to working together. Professor Daltrey spoke about the university and his own experiences, mentioning that he is a widower and lives with his girlfriend. The friendly conversation ended with Professor Daltrey mentioning that he had arranged temporary accommodation with his friend, Nathaniel Thompson. He lives along the St. Christopher Trail and runs a guest house. If you are looking for a more cozy option, I recommend exploring the residences in St. Christopher's Forest. 
Some houses are located next to the lake, and several plots of land have a building permit for university staff. However, I must note that the most suitable site is already occupied by our part-time assistant. The professor looked at her thoughtfully, and then added, This person works great with children who may have learning or behavioral problems. Our new training center was created specifically to help children reach their full potential by a person who prefers to keep a low profile. I would really like him to become a teacher at our center, but he declined my offers and prefers to keep his distance. Meanwhile, Gemma was exploring St. Christopher's Wood, and after two months of acclimatization, she decided that she wanted to make this place her home. When Nadia Thompson was walking next to Gemma, they came across a sign that caught their attention. It read, Land for Sale, and at the bottom there was a postscript stating that the construction permit had already been received. Gemma couldn't help but express her admiration for the picturesque place and said she could live here, but she wondered who would be able to design a house that would complement the natural environment and revitalize it. Nadia replied with a smile that she knew exactly such a person. Their close friend, an aeronautical engineer and designer, had the skills and vision to create a dream home in such a beautiful place. You should have seen the house he designed and is building for himself. He usually keeps to himself, but when he opens up, it's really nice to talk to him. I invited him to dinner on Friday, so you will have the opportunity to meet him if you are interested, Nadia said with a smile. With pleasure, Gemma replied impatiently. Meanwhile, at the Van Dam house, Brooke hesitantly asked, Grandfather? Rufus Van Dam turned to face her, his sharp eyes studying her intently. He recognized her as the mother of his great-grandchildren, a woman connected to the wrong person. Sensing her distress, he asked softly, Yes, dear. What happened? Brooke hesitated before asking, Do you know where Jake is? Rufus Sr. was silent for a moment, and then mysteriously replied, I can neither confirm nor deny this. Why are you asking? Problems in paradise? Brooke was stunned by the unexpected question and struggled to find her voice, but eventually managed to whisper, Yes. The old man couldn't help but notice Brooke's reaction. It was clear that it was time to talk to her about Rufus Jr. In a stern tone, he remarked, There are disgusting moments in Rufus's character, don't you agree? and his dependence on steroids certainly doesn't improve the situation. Brooke hesitated and said, I don't quite understand what you're talking about. The old man chuckled and warned her, Don't try to deceive me. I may be old, but I'm far from weak, as my son and eldest grandson often think. I understand perfectly well that these two charming children of yours are not Jake's children. How ridiculous! screamed Brooke. Don't underestimate me, dear. I'm willing to put all my wealth on the line. You have blue eyes, and Jake has green eyes, and both of your children have brown eyes. This is almost genetically unlikely. They clearly don't look like Jake. Rufus and Jake were so similar to each other, but Rufus has brown eyes, and you spent a lot of time in his bed, Brooke. Brooke's world collapsed when she heard her grandfather's words. The backs of the chairs creaked under her grip, and her fingers turned pale with tension. Despite all his efforts, his tongue remained paralyzed, unable to utter a word. Her grandfather's accusations pierced her heart. His words deeply wounded her. He accused her of putting her life at the mercy of the wrong person, allowing him to dispose of her and their children. And now, faced with an unexpected denouement, she dared to think about getting Jake back. I wouldn't help you find Jake even if I knew where he was. Now go, Rufus Sr. said decisively. After Brooke left, Grandpa stood at the window in deep thought and reasoned, maybe it's finally time to write this long letter. During their stay in the Thompson family, Gemma and Nadia managed to get closer, but so far, she has not been accepted into their house. While waiting for an answer to her knock on the door, Gemma looked around the neighborhood feeling a little uneasy. When the door finally opened, she was greeted with, Oh, hello, you must be Gemma. My name is Nathaniel, but to everyone, I'm Nathan. Nadia calls me by my full name when she's upset. 
Don't be shy, come on in. Nadia is in the kitchen, Nadia's husband said, letting Gemma inside. Gemma was taken aback when she noticed the scar on his face. When Nathan took her to the kitchen, she noticed that he was in good physical shape, but slightly limping. What could have caused this? A friendly greeting awaited Gemma in the kitchen. She introduced herself to Jacob, their young son, and then turned her attention to Nadia. The beauty of this house and its surroundings is simply breathtaking. How did you come across such a treasure? Nadia's expression changed for a moment as memories flashed through her mind. This is a story filled with both grief and joy, but in the end it ends on a positive note. I'll share it with you one day. But out of respect for Nathan, I have to get his permission first. This is a story that very few people know about, known only to a select few. At the moment, I can only point out that Nathan successfully wrested power from despotic local leaders and defeated them. And Jacob is not my son. He is the son of Nathan and his late wife. But I am happy to announce that in six months, Jacob will no longer be the only child in our family. Gemma hugged Nadia and said, this is amazing news. She couldn't wait to find out the date of the baby's birth. Nathan interrupted her in mid-sentence. Gemma, let me introduce you. But before he could finish, Gemma exclaimed, Jake! Without thinking, she rushed to him and hugged him. Jake remained unperturbed and simply said, Gemma, we haven't seen each other for a long time. Feeling awkward, Gemma released him from her embrace. Nadia and Nathan exchanged glances, and Nathan asked, Do you know each other? Before Gemma could respond, Jake said, We used to be friends. Gemma's joy quickly turned to sadness, and tears appeared in her eyes. It was not the joyful meeting she had hoped for. She almost burst into tears when she asked Jake, Why are you so distant? Aren't you glad to see me? I've missed you so much. Jake was stunned and puzzled by her reaction. He glanced at his hosts, but Nathan just nodded and offered, We have to leave you two alone. You can use the office over there. Sitting in the office, Jake watched his once close friend who was now visibly upset. You informed Brooke that we had an intimate relationship during my marriage to her. I even signed an affidavit. This revelation eventually led to the destruction of my marriage. Why should I be glad to see you after the pain and betrayal caused by this lie? Reflecting on the extent of the deception, Gemma felt a surge of anger towards Brooke for orchestrating such a manipulative scheme to tarnish Jake's reputation in their society. In a determined tone, she turned to Jake, demanding his full attention. I need you to listen to me carefully, Gemma said. Before coming here, I lived abroad for three years. I once heard Brooke bragging about it in a pub. I couldn't resist exposing her in front of everyone. Shortly after that, I went to your parents to explain where I had been for three years. I also talked to your grandfather, who assured me that you are doing well and that I will most likely see you soon. That's when I decided to find you, unaware that our meeting would happen so quickly. I admit, I really missed you, Gemma said. Jake blushed at the last words. What about the affidavit? Jake asked. It's all fake. Jake, my feelings for you haven't changed. I still love you. There's no way I would have started a relationship with you while you were married. I would never have been able to do that. I struggled with the feeling of betrayal, doubting my actions and what I had done to deserve it. Do you believe me? Gemma asked. Of course, he replied. You have already proved one fact by talking to my grandfather. I believe you can do the same with the rest of the items. Besides, you've always been honest with me in the past. So yes, I believe you. Gemma felt a wave of relief wash over her. The first obstacle was overcome. Now she needed to find a way to express her feelings to him. Would he feel the same way? Taking a deep breath, she plucked up the courage and slightly pushing back her chair, wanted to ask. Jake walked over to Gemma and wrapped his arms around her, hugging her gently, and then asked, Can you forgive me? Gemma replied with a note of indignation. Forgive me for what? Jake explained, that you've been terribly manipulated. 
Gemma reassured him, there is nothing to forgive. In a moment of unexpected intimacy, Jake bent down to kiss Gemma on the cheek, but she turned her head and their lips touched. Gemma put her hand on the back of Jake's head, pulled him closer, and kissed him passionately. Breaking off the kiss with a wide smile, Gemma's eyes sparkled at the newfound connection between them. Jake was speechless. Did you really just kiss me? He asked, still trying to process what had just happened. Gemma nodded, a mischievous gleam in her eyes. I've wanted this ever since I found out you weren't with that slutty girl anymore, she confessed. I didn't even claim you for Brooke. Just let me know if I'm in too much of a hurry. Her words hung in the air, leaving Jake confused and undecided. I'm not exactly in perfect shape, he admitted, feeling vulnerable and at the same time strangely calm when Gemma was next to him. I decided to build my house in a secluded place for a reason. I prefer to take my time and heal before facing my demons. The pain is too much to bear. If you let me in, I promise to always be by your side. I know you married Brooke because she was pregnant, but I can't help but wonder if the kids are really yours. It's a strange situation, and now it's time to join our friends. And one more thing, think about accepting a job offer from Professor Dahl III. It can be useful for you in many ways. When they returned to the Thompsons, Gemma made a simple statement. We have decided and discussed everything. He's mine now, although he's not completely sure about it yet. Nadia expressed her joy by clapping her hands and exclaiming, Wonderful! You handled it quickly. What's next? Then Gemma snuggled up to Jake, pulling him to her, and smiled with a feeling of deep satisfaction in her voice. I have big plans she said, hinting that there is retribution in the plans. Firstly, I will never let this guy out of my sight again. And secondly, who should I turn to find out about that piece of land that we saw this afternoon? The dinner was held at a height, filled with laughter and stories told by Gemma from the time of their friendship. As the evening progressed, the atmosphere became more and more serious, and Gemma finally asked Jake a difficult question. How did Brooke explain the fact that she managed to give birth to a fully developed son after just six and a half months of pregnancy? Jake answered this question in the negative. I was there completely fascinated and not understanding anything. Looking back, I realize how stupid I was. But what exactly are you implying? Nathan, understanding the strong emotions associated with the birth of a child, gently hinted that the children might not be his and that it might be a setup but they are strikingly similar to me and to each other, like brother and sister. This is undeniable. Jake hesitated, not daring to voice his suspicions out loud. Without delay, Gemma and Nadia clung to him, hugging him tightly and whispering something softly in his ear. Jake pulled himself together and asked, What should I do next? I need certainty. Nadia took his hand and asked, Can you remember a person who looks very much like you? Gemma added, Rufus, you are very similar. Jake shook his head. No, they have a strained relationship. Nadia paused, considering the possibility that they might have been pretending to deflect suspicion from themselves. There is only one way to accurately establish paternity, an official DNA test. To understand this complex legal process, you will need a high-class lawyer. Donna Marshall is not just one of the best, but the best in her field. Nathan, could you get in touch with her? Nadia said. These are difficult times for Brooke. Despite Rufus Sr.'s refusal to help her find Jake, she still couldn't find a solution. She was horrified at the thought that her children were in touch with Rufus Jr., but at the same time, she was somewhat dependent on him. She only needed him for the money he brought. When Brooke was doing household chores and the children were doing their homework, there was a sudden knock on the door. Looking through the small window, she saw a man and a woman waiting outside. When she opened the door, she asked, How can I help you? The woman asked, Are you Mrs. Puckett, Mrs. Brooke Puckett, the ex-wife of Mr. Jacob Randall Van Dam? After confirming her identity, she asked, What's the matter? The man replied, I have a warrant. We need DNA samples from your children. 
Failure to comply with this warrant may lead to arrest, the man explained. Confused, Brooke asked, Why do you need DNA samples from my children? Is this for a paternity test? The woman answered simply, causing Brooke to have a sudden wave of despair. She had always hoped that her children might be the reason for Jake's return to her. Another important factor was the significant amount of alimony that Jake paid for the maintenance of the children. If he finds out that the children don't belong to him, the financial support will stop, and she will no longer be able to lead her luxurious lifestyle. At the same time, another ambulance crew and a policeman arrived at Rufus Van Dam's apartment. Rufus Sr. watched closely, realizing that Gemma had most likely found Jake, and he had found out the truth. Rufus Jr. refused to cooperate and attacked a law enforcement officer. The obese man could not cope with a younger and more muscular guy, and Rufus Sr. watched in horror as his grandson, noticeably limping, was escorted to a police car. Two weeks later, the results finally became known. Jake, the results are ready, exclaimed Gemma, heading towards Jake with a sense of alarm. Jake had a hard time, and Gemma knew she had to give him unwavering support. Sitting together on the couch, Jake carefully studied the document and the test results. Gemma noticed that when Jake finished reading, his complexion paled, and he looked extremely worried. Worried, she asked, Jake, what's the matter? You look like you're about to have a seizure. Jake assured her that he wasn't having a seizure, but he could feel it coming. Olivia and Brian are actually Rufus's children. He swore that he would make Rufus and his conniving ex-wife pay for all the pain they had caused him. Gemma instinctively snuggled up to Jake to comfort him, hoping that her presence would give him the same sense of calm and security that he had given her. Despite Gemma's attempts, Jake continued to resist, exchanging only chaste hugs and an occasional peck on the cheek. Gemma's desire burned inside her, longing for an outlet. Looking into Jake's eyes, she saw vulnerability and shyness in them that touched her heart. Jake spoke softly, expressing his love for her and apologizing for not being able to give her what she needed. He acknowledged his own shortcomings and promised to fix everything. I hope you'll believe me when I tell you that I feel the same way you do. But before I can fully devote myself to you, I need to resolve some issues. I assure you, I will handle them, even if it is difficult. I don't want you to be involved in the difficulties ahead. If we start a relationship now, it could lead to you feeling like a rebound, which would be unfair to your emotions. If you don't have the patience to wait for me to figure myself out, I completely understand you. Just let me know, and we can part amicably. Gemma felt a wave of relief wash over her, like a refreshing shower on a sultry day. She understood how difficult it was for the shy man standing in front of her to open up and express his true feelings. The depth of love behind his words touched her to the depths of her soul, and she took a moment to appreciate these emotions. With a light movement, Gemma freed her hand from behind Jake's back and pulled him to her, biting into his lips with a kiss filled with all the love she felt for him. Jake's lips tingled as if they had been hit by a nine-volt battery. The shock gripped him for several reasons, firstly from Gemma's unexpected reaction, and secondly, her refusal to accept his attempt to push her away. With a soft voice and a gentle touch, Gemma said, Nonsense, Jake. No more excuses. You confessed your love to me and I'm not going anywhere. I will be by your side at every step. I will support and help you in everything. Jake wrapped his arms around Gemma grateful for her constant presence. He kissed her gently on the top of her head, thinking how good she smelled. In a timid whisper, he suggested, Why don't you postpone the construction of the house until this mess is resolved? You may not need it by then. In the meantime, I could modernize and expand my house to meet your needs, Jake suggested. Gemma was shocked. Had he really asked her to move in with him? She decided to clarify and asked, Is this an invitation to move in with you? Yes, it is. By giving yourself to me, you have demonstrated your devotion, and I want you to know that I am just as devoted to you. If you want a ring and a wedding, I don't mind. But I think marriage is more than just a name. 
If we both promise to be faithful and devote our whole lives to each other, then this is really important to me. I want us to have rings as a symbol of our loyalty. I prefer simple wedding rings for both of us. The following week, Jake and Gemma met Donna Marshall at the office. Jake was determined to take revenge by suggesting a method using napalm. But Donna calmly informed him that she couldn't help with such a radical plan. Jake needs someone ruthless to navigate the murky waters and strike an unexpected blow. Fortunately, Donna knew one colleague who had been in a similar situation and shared Jake's contempt for those who profit from others. They were introduced by an advertising agent, and since then they have been exchanging clients and cooperating in business. While doing household chores, Brooke couldn't help but think about the lack of response after the DNA tests. But she cautiously began to hope that the situation would resolve itself. She managed to protect her children from Rufus's influence thanks to the support of her grandfather, whom she trusted. Rufus Jr. seems to have become wary of Rufus Sr. ever since the police took him out of the apartment. Suddenly, Brooke's peace was disturbed by a loud knock on the front door. Cautiously approaching, she opened the door and saw Rufus standing, his face flushed with anger and his body visibly trembling. He held a pile of papers in his hands and demanded in a thunderous voice, Brooke took a step back, feeling a surge of anxiety. I don't know. You tell me, she replied. This despicable brother is trying to extort a ridiculous amount of money from me for taking care of my own children. He even confiscated all my belongings to force me to comply. Brooke entered the house and collapsed into a chair, her heart pounding. Oh no, Jake is awake and alert. Now that he knows the truth about the children, he wants revenge. If he comes after me, I'm finished. Jake is ruthless. The realization that her comfortable lifestyle was coming to an end filled her with fear. Rufus was continuing his speech when another knock sounded in the room. Brooke tried her best to block him out, but the persistent knocking grew louder. Sighing heavily, she got up from her seat and headed for the door. When she opened it, a short man in a hat, round glasses and a mustache appeared in front of her. A woman stood behind him, holding a video camera with a flashing red light indicating that she was recording. Are you Mrs. Brooke Pack? The man asked. Nodding, she confirmed her identity. Without saying another word, he handed her an envelope and simply said, Here's a letter for you. Have a nice day, he said. And they walked to their parked car. Brooke's heart filled with horror as she watched them drive away not daring to move until the car was out of sight. Only then did she finally close the door, turn around, and slowly walk back to her chair. The terror inside her turned into a dark, swirling mass. With trembling hands, she opened the envelope, and her fear increased when she read the documents inside. DNA tests showed that Jake is not the father of any of the children, and this caused her shock and disbelief. Other documents contained demands to return the money she received as alimony, as well as interest and other demands. The lawsuit said that she made him believe that the children belonged to him and persuaded him to marry by making false accusations. The total amount of claims was prohibitive. In addition, there was a document from Gemma Evans on the falsification of sworn testimony and another on defamation. Brooke was in a panic until Rufus assured her that the company would cover all expenses. She was the mother of his children, right? In the evening, Brooke went to a family dinner, where Rufus Jr. announced that they had feelings for each other, and she was now his chosen one. He assured her that he would take care of the children after he dealt with the unreasonable demands of his brother and his girlfriend. His grandfather intervened, advising him to contact a lawyer, since the company would not cover his deception and Brooke's actions, he reminded Rufus Jr. that Jake had already suffered enough from their actions. There was silence at the table until Jake's father spoke up, asking why Rufus shouldn't defend himself against the accusations. He argued that Rufus had every right to defend his reputation with the help of the company's qualified lawyers. Rufus Sr. intervened and said, In fact... The accusations are not groundless. Rufus and Brooke cheated on Jake from the very beginning, 
Apparently Jake has DNA confirming that the children are Rufus's children. If that's the case, then Jake is absolutely right. In addition, the company has very clear rules regarding relationships, and you have violated them all. Therefore, if lawyers are involved, it will not be to confront Jake, but to support the company's rules, which Rufus ignored all the time while Jake was with Brooke. Randall exploded, exclaiming, You can't do that! I'm the CEO, not you! Rufus Sr. chuckled softly and replied, But I own more than half of the shares in this company. As chairman of the board of directors, I have the ultimate decision-making power. Decisions of the CEO may be overturned by the board of directors, including on legal issues. Therefore, our legal team will not participate in a lawsuit just to stroke someone's ego. Rufus Jr. was beside himself with rage. He kicked his chair in a rage and ran out of the room. In the hallway, he tried to calm down and catch his breath. Rufus Sr. hurriedly threw down his napkin, apologized, and followed his grandson out of the dining room. In the hallway, Rufus Sr. couldn't help but feel a pang of sympathy for the broken man standing in front of him. But this feeling was quickly replaced by memories of the evil Rufus Jr. had done to his own brother. As he passed by, he spoke in a soft but threatening tone. If I find out, I'll bury you so deep that even the devil won't find you. Do you understand the seriousness of my words? Rufus Jr. was stunned by the threat. Despite his pride and arrogance, he replied, And how are you going to achieve that, old man? People respect me too. Try it, and you'll see that this old dog has not forgotten how to bite yet. With these words, Rufus Sr. went up to his grandson, who was still catching his breath, and lightly patted him on the back. Back at his apartment, Rufus Sr. sat down at his desk and began flipping through an old notebook to find the phone number of St. Christopher Crossing University. The next morning, during breakfast, Rufus Sr. was inundated with letters from his son Randall and Rufus Jr., demanding access to the company's legal advisors. After carefully examining the documents, they came to the conclusion that the legal dispute would cost them a tidy sum. The only chance of success was to drag out the fight as long as possible, hoping that Jake would eventually run out of funds. But Rufus Sr. remained adamant in his position, warning that any attempt to seek legal assistance from a company lawyer would result in immediate dismissal. This is an inappropriate use of the company's assets. Do you understand? He quickly left the dining room, passing both men. Sitting down at his desk, he immediately dialed the university's number. Good morning, this is Professor Van Dam. May I speak to Professor Daltrey? I would really appreciate it if he would give me a few minutes. Soon, a familiar voice rang out. Rufus, my old friend, I haven't heard from you in a long time. How are you? Rufus Sr. smiled faintly, but as he spoke, his expression quickly became serious. Mentally, I'm fine, he began, but physically, I'm not so good. However, more on that later. I need a favor from you, my friend. It concerns two people. Leon nodded, remembering the past, when he supported Rufus in a dubious case involving a dubious person blackmailing university student. I've always had your back, Leon replied, and now I'm here. What do you need? Rufus Sr. sighed. I'm afraid you might not like it, Leon. I plan to come to your house and try to recruit two of your employees into my company. Leon raised an eyebrow in surprise. Which two employees do you want to recruit? He asked. Jake Van Dam and Gemma Evans, Rufus Sr. replied. Leon hesitated for a moment before answering. I understand your interest in Jake, but Gemma Evans? I talked to her recently and she told me something about Jake's divorce. She came to me looking for a way out of this situation and expressed her desire to find Jake. Based on what I know, I believe they are already connected. When can we meet with them? I want them to be ready to talk. It will take two hours to get there, but I can leave in half an hour. It would be great if you could join us too. Will you be able to come? Leon agreed and said, I'll do it. You seem to be in a hurry. Yes, Rufus Sr. replied simply. See you in a few hours. Later that day, 
Leon was stunned by the appearance of his old friend. Despite his frail and tired appearance, his voice remained strong and his eyes shone. Before Leon invited Jake and Gemma into his office, a tense conversation took place between the older men. The reunion of Jack and his grandfather caused mixed feelings, regret for the lost time and happiness from the opportunity to hug each other once again. Rufus Sr., without requiring an introduction, immediately spoke up. Jake, would you like to come back and lead the company? Grandpa asked. But Grandpa, what about Dad and Brother? Jake asked. Rufus Sr. smiled sadly and replied, I am unwell and my condition is getting worse. I'm afraid I won't be able to stop the chaos that this terrible couple is causing in my company. I believe that you have the potential to lead the company effectively. I have seen your abilities through my own experience. Jake was stunned and instinctively grabbed Gemma's hand. He was at a loss. Why didn't you tell me about this? I have my reasons, Jake. But can you dispel my doubts? Of course, your friend won't mind either. I'm building a house right now. A family home for both of us, Grandpa, Jake said, looking at Gemma. A family homes? Who says you need to act too fast? Should I stop taking the pills? She interrupted jokingly. Jake answered quickly. As soon as possible. I would like you and me to have children, if you agree. Gemma jumped for joy and kissed Jake on the lips. Yesterday I took the last pill. Did that satisfy your curiosity? Rufus's stern voice interrupted the tender moment. Let me remind you that we are still in a professional environment. Jake and the office will only be a few hours away. Jake met Gemma's gaze. Gemma gave a barely perceptible nod of approval, and then Jake accepted Rufus's offer to lead the company. Turning to his grandfather, Jake raised the issue of his father and brother. Rufus assured him that he would resolve the issue, and promised that once Jake took over the company, they would no longer be able to cause trouble. Rufus admitted that he also holds a grudge against them, sharing Jake's feelings. Jake asked when he should take over the reins of government. Gemma expressed her joy that Jake would be running the company. Yes, Grandfather, we will definitely do it. But when exactly? I feel like my time is running out. Symptoms will start soon and the pain will become too much. After the tragic death of his wife, Leon and several other people decided to establish a small private clinic dedicated to end-of-life care. I've arranged to go there in about ten days. It turns out that soon after that, Grandpa said sadly. Jake was lost in thought when Gemma suddenly asked, Why all this secrecy? I have a feeling that Randall and Rufus will stop at nothing to protect their lifestyle. Rufus is already annoyed with Jake, and I had to threaten him when he tried to use the company's legal resources to fight Jake's lawsuits, Grandpa replied. We came up with a plan to fight off Randall and Rufus. Do you want me to take care of it, or would you prefer it yourself? Rufus Sr. replied wearily, Get on with it. I'm tired. After Rufus's death, a message will be sent to trusted persons in the office, workshop, and factory about the blocking of the entire company. To do this, I plan to create software similar to a ransomware program. Employees will be sent home with full pay for the duration of the lockdown, as this has already been provided, Leon added. Jake and Gemma were shocked by the scale of the plan and asked about their role in it. You will be kept informed, but it is important that you do not take any action before the reading of the will. By this point, everything will be clear, and you will be able to take over the management of the company. By then, Randall and Rufus will be the least of your worries, Jake's grandfather said wearily. We have already settled this situation. I'll write you a letter explaining everything in detail. In the meantime, you'd better stay in the dark about current events. Grandpa, can I visit you at the clinic? Jake asked, his voice trembling with excitement. I'm sorry, son, but it's better if you stay away. I want to be alone when I meet my creator, and it won't be the most pleasant sight, his grandfather replied. With that, we say goodbye. And one more thing, promise me that you will take care of your mother. She's as innocent as you are. I promise, Grandpa, we'll take care of her, Jake assured him. 
With a heavy heart, they said goodbye and Jake left with Gemma, feeling mixed feelings. It took Jake and Gemma a while to digest the heartbreaking news. After some silence, Jake sighed heavily and said, I'm going to miss the old man. He was like a father to me, even more than my own father. He only paid attention to Rufus. In response, Gemma simply hugged Jake and kissed him comfortingly, whispering, I know. Two weeks later, Jake completed negotiations with a contractor to complete their house in the woods. This news prompted Jake to speed up the process of finishing the house, and Nathan recommended this particular contractor as fast, reliable, and offering high-quality work. Having made the decision to live together, Jake began to renovate the house, which was supposed to turn it into a spacious house with five bedrooms and two living rooms. The renovation included the installation of a deep geothermal heating system and power supply to the house using solar panels and two wind turbines. While Jake was sitting outside the house and pondering the sad news, Gemma arrived. Despite her best efforts, she only managed to partially calm him down. Jake expressed the feeling that a part of himself had been taken away from him. The next day, the lawyer contacted him about the reading of the will. Jake, accompanied by Gemma, prepared for what awaited him. Suddenly, he noticed that a black sedan was following them. Acting quickly, he turned into the parking lot adjacent to the mall. When they were about to get out, the car stopped next to them. A woman got out of the car and signaled to him to roll down the window. Jake complied with the woman's request without turning off the engine or pressing the gas pedal until she showed her ID. Sir, we are from the FBI, and we are here to protect you until this case is resolved. When you are present at the reading, please act as if you are unaware of our presence. Everything will be revealed during the reading according to Mr. Van Damme's wishes. Jake entered the conference room, leaving Gemma in the waiting area, and saw that all his relatives had already gathered. Rufus Jr. grinned maliciously, saying, The prodigal son has returned to receive his rightful share. But before he could finish his barb, the lawyer interrupted him. Behave yourself, sir, or you will be escorted out, the lawyer warned sternly. Rufus tried to speak again, but the lawyer firmly repeated, Behave yourself. If you don't know how to behave, you can wait for your family outside. Do you understand? Rufus muttered something under his breath, which caused the lawyer to repeat, I can't make out a word of what you're saying. Do you understand that if you break the rules again, you will be expelled from the premises? Randall wanted to intervene, but Rufus stopped him with an imperious gesture. It was clear that the lawyer could not be contradicted. Great. Now that all this nonsense has been eliminated, we can proceed with the formalities. Suddenly, the image of the wizard Gandalf from the Lord of the Rings appeared in front of Jake. He can easily be compared to a behavior lawyer. Although he was friendly and gentle, when he was annoyed he became tough and unforgiving. Jake was brought back to reality when he heard his name called, just in time to hear the announcement that all his assets in the office were going to his only son, Jacob Randall Van Dam, who would now become his heir as chairman of the board of Van Dam Aeronautical Industries. Jake was puzzled by his grandfather's statement that he had an only son. Wasn't his father the only son? Jake was confused, trying to figure out the situation. His mother looked unperturbed, a smile playing on her lips, while Randall and Rufus reacted with anger. I'm his son, and Rufus is my son, shouted Randall, ready to get into a fight with the lawyer. But the lawyer remained unperturbed, ignoring the outburst of anger. Without thinking, he pressed the button, and a few moments later, four men entered the room. It seemed that they easily tore off the gorilla's arms and confidently positioned themselves next to the angry men. One of them growled at Randall. You don't want me to hurt you, do you, sir? Randall quickly retreated, but Rufus, known for his lack of self-control, tried to attack Jake, shouting, I'll finish you, you bastard! A moment later, Rufus was already sitting up, painfully squeezing his thumb and wrist. After restoring order, the lawyer continued to speak. My dear friend Rufus foresaw this unpleasant situation, 
So I asked these gentlemen to be present here to keep the peace. He turned to Randall and said, Mr. Van Dam has genetic data proving that you are not his son, which is why he divorced your mother. Therefore, Rufus Jr. is not his grandson. The lawyer paused briefly to make sure that Randall understood the seriousness of what was said and then continued without taking his eyes off him. After learning about your mistreatment of your wife, an extravagant lifestyle at the expense of the company and connections with escort girls, he proposed to your wife. She agreed and subsequently became pregnant by Rufus Van Dam. Notarized affidavits and additional genetic data confirm that Jacob Randall Van Dam is the second son of Anna Van Dam Hansen and Rufus Van Dam. Randall's anger boiled over, and he attacked his wife, accusing her of infidelity. You betrayed me! Your actions will have consequences! I'll make sure you run into them! He shouted angrily. The lawyer quickly intervened, signaling the two men to restrain Randall. Meanwhile, Rufus was sitting in place like a fish in water. The lawyer turned to the men and said, Please take note of these threats and aggressive behavior. And as for you, Randall, we have evidence of your involvement in a major embezzlement scheme with your son. You embezzled about $6 million from the company to finance your rampant lifestyle, not even taking into account the undisclosed amount hidden in the Cayman Islands. In addition, you have been involved in the sale of security-sensitive technologies to unauthorized organizations, including rogue states and competitors. As a result, government agencies responsible for national security, such as the IRS and the FBI, want to conduct a thorough investigation into both of you. Regardless of whether you want to cooperate or not, you both have an obligation to help them with the investigation. Looking at the four men holding Randall and Rufus, he calmly asked, Could you escort these people to the exit and hand them over to the authorities? Brooke stood outside and watched Jake enter the house with Gemma. True to her promise, Gemma hugged Jake tightly. But the world of marriage collapsed when Rufus and his father left the building. Their driver's licenses were checked, and half an hour later they were taken away in different cars. A moment later, panic seized her and she clung to one of the men who were leading the father and son, handing them over to the police. I can't give you any details, ma'am. I can only say that they will help the authorities with the investigation, and it will be a long process, the man told her. Another man joined the conversation. It seems that they are wanted for fraud, embezzlement, industrial espionage, and transfer of secret technologies to countries under sanctions. I doubt you'll see them in the next two decades. Who will take a seat on the company's board of directors? Brooke asked, feeling a sense of unease creep over her. A man who came with a woman on his arm, she was answered. She didn't know everything that had happened at home, but now she knew for sure that Jake had won, leaving her without the luxurious lifestyle and legal protection that Rufus had assured her of. Depressed, she headed for the car that belonged to Rufus. She discovered that the car was unlocked and saw a keychain thrown on the panel. Upset and depressed, she went home. A month later, Brooke was in a desperate situation. Her small salary was not enough, especially with the lifestyle she was used to. Now she needed to come up with a plan to make more money or cut costs. Most of all, she was worried about how to pay for the children's education. The only solution she could see was to convince Jake to help with the children, even if it meant tearing him away from another woman. During her relationship with Rufus, she indulged in excessive partying and drinking. At his insistence, she underwent extensive plastic surgery to eliminate the changes in her body after the birth of two children. Her stomach was tightened, her breasts were tightened and enlarged, her face was tightened and her lips were made permanent. As a result, she lost that natural beauty that initially attracted Jake's attention. Instead, she became like the singer Cher, although she lost her healthy glow. Brooke's skin seemed unnatural and inelastic. Brooke ignored all this, confident that she could easily replace Gemma. In the early morning, she was sitting in her car, parked so that she could see who was leaving the house. If it was Jake, she planned to leave and come back later. But if it's Gemma, 
She'll wait a few minutes to make sure she doesn't come back, and then she'll go knock on the door and win her husband back. A moment later, a blue Nissan Rogue appeared and quickly disappeared around the corner. After checking her makeup one last time, she waited five minutes before getting out of the car and heading for the front door. Brooke knew that Jake had designed and built part of the house himself, so she made a mental note to admire his work. Perhaps she could suggest some changes to make the house even more suitable for him. The house was located on a hill and faced north. In the front of the house there were two large windows on either side of the door, closed with decorative shutters. Brooke adjusted her shirt to emphasize her cleavage and knocked. The sound echoed through the house as she waited patiently. Time seemed to drag on, and she stood and stood on the verge of giving up and leaving. As she was about to leave, the door opened soundlessly and Jake stood in front of her. His face was unreadable, but he was silent, not letting her know that he was inviting her in. Finally, in a seductive tone, she greeted him. Hi, Jake. You look good. Life seems to be treating you well. Jake simply replied, Brooke, for some reason I knew you were coming. What do you want? Jake asked. I want us to talk. Won't you invite me into the house? He sighed and said, Let's get this over with once and for all. Come in. Jake led her to his office, which was the closest. He didn't want Brooke to see the rest of the house. Guessing why she had come, he invited her to sit down. Taking a chair on the other side of the table, he said, Okay, Brooke, tell me. What do you want from me? Aren't you going to give me a tour of the rest of the house? Brooke asked. No, why should I? Jake replied. Tell me why you're here. Jake, are you really so blind that you don't understand that we are destined to be together? We have a past and two children. I need you to come back to me. Jake stared at Brooke, wondering what was going on. Is she going crazy? He thought. Aloud, he said, We do have a past, but my version of this story is very different from yours. You must be completely crazy if you think we have any chance of reuniting, Jake said firmly. Brooke didn't look stunned by his response. I know I've ruined everything, but we still have to think about the kids. I can't support them the way I have to. They're not even mine. I have proof that they belong to Rufus. Why should I be responsible? You've been taking care of them all this time, and you've been doing a great job. Rufus was never capable of that, Brooke continued. Jake sighed and reluctantly agreed. I will take care of them, but only because Mom asked me to. I don't want this money to fall into your hands. I'm not interested in improving your lifestyle. Brooke was stunned by Jake's response. It wasn't what she expected. She had always been able to manipulate him in the past, but now she realized that everything had changed after their divorce. She wanted Jake to take care of her and the kids, but it looks like it's not going to be that easy this time. She resorted to a new tactic. Jake, she said in a soft, seductive tone, I understand that I hurt you, but it was all because of Rufus's influence. Now that he's gone, we can be useful to each other. Just imagine what I can offer you. In the bedroom, I have such skills that you will be speechless. Forget about this frivolous woman and come back to me. We could live a full life together, as a family should. After a short silence, Jake did not react in any way, and Brooke decided that she had won their exchange of opinions. But her words had the opposite effect on the man standing in front of her. You embody the traits of a woman of easy virtue both in appearance and in actions. Given our history, I'd better stay away from you. I won't lay a finger on you. As for your children, I have arranged for them to be accommodated in St. Christopher's Crossing. Olivia will study there, and Brian will stay with his grandmother until he goes to college with her. Obviously, you are not able to take proper care of him and provide him with a secure home, so I took care of that. But you shouldn't expect financial help from me, because you actually owe me money. Jake's words hung in the air as Brooke sat in a daze. If you try to resist, I will file a fraud and extortion report, he threatened, 
his voice cold and calculating. I will inform the authorities that the children are not mine, and that because of this you robbed me during the divorce. Now get lost. I've had enough. As soon as he finished speaking, the door creaked open and Gemma cautiously entered the room. Jake looked at her and said, Come in. My guest is about to leave. With a heavy heart, Brooke got up and headed for the door, realizing that their relationship was really over. Gemma came into the room, beaming, with a noticeably enlarged belly. She purposefully walked up to Jake and kissed him on the cheek. In a low voice, she confirmed her suspicions to him. Jake's grin widened, confirming the news. Brooke could no longer contain her excitement. You're pregnant, she exclaimed, realizing that her plans had gone to waste. Gemma and Jake exchanged meaningful glances, silently acknowledging that they had a new chapter ahead of them. Jake nodded slightly as Gemma turned to Brooke and quietly shared, Yes, I'm pregnant. I want to give Jake the children he's always dreamed of. Brooke was taken aback. And I heard that you're already leaving? We need to start making plans, for example, to redo the children's room. Suddenly it dawned on Brooke. Children? You mean... Gemma's face was glowing with joy. Yes, I'm expecting twins. I'm three months pregnant. I got worried when my stomach started to swell so early. At the first ultrasound, both babies were not visible, as one was hidden behind the other. The second ultrasound confirmed the presence of two babies and their gender. Brooke kissed Jake passionately and whispered, Boys! Brooke exploded. You can't leave me like that. Don't leave me to my fate. Take care of my children, your niece and nephew. Jake, dropping all politeness, replied in a tone Brooke knew all too well, but Gemma hadn't seen yet. I'm not sure about my connection to Olivia and Brian. You understand that Randall was not the biological son of Rufus Sr., and I am also not the biological son of Randall, but the child of Rufus Sr. Despite sharing a mother, Brooke hasn't spoken to them since Randall and Rufus Jr. were arrested. Anna also distanced herself from her and did not want to have anything to do with her. It became obvious to Brooke that she was really lonely and isolated. Living in a dilapidated apartment and struggling to make ends meet, she was forced to sell off her possessions one by one. Lost in her own thoughts, she barely paid attention to Jake's words until he spoke again. If it were up to me, you could rot in hell, he said coldly. But my mother and Gemma think that you will remain broken and helpless there. They reminded me that you are still the mother of your children, and they may feel obligated to take care of you, and I don't want them to do that. That's why I've arranged a simple physical job for you. Brooke was struggling to make ends meet, desperately trying to find a job that would allow her to pay rent and basic living expenses. Despite the fact that she submitted many applications, she was constantly refused. Having no other options, she faced the fact that in search of work, she would have to go far away, separating her from her children. In a moment of desperation, Jake handed her a business card with the address and phone number, stressing that this was her last chance to keep in touch with the children. Gemma added that this job offer is very important, as it is the only opportunity available to her after the upcoming trials. Not taking advantage of this chance, Brooke risks losing custody of the children. Olivia will live in St. Christopher's Crossing and Brian will live with Anna. They are well aware of the betrayal you have committed towards the man they considered their father, Gemma added, and made it clear with a gesture that it was time for Brooke to leave. As they stood on the doorstep, Gemma delivered the final blow to Brooke, stating, I came out the winner. I have Jake, and he and I are going to have kids. Your selfishness ruined Jake. You bet on the wrong man, guided only by your mercantile desires. I have the best man next to me and you are left with nothing. Gemma looked sternly at Brooke and said, Listen carefully. If you dare to make an attempt on Jake, I will not hesitate to intervene. Any attempt to manipulate children or harm Jake will not go unpunished. I will not rest until you are completely defeated. Brooke was stunned by Gemma's direct threats and palpable hostility. Answer me. Do you understand? Your abuse of Jake will stop. Did you understand my words? Gemma's voice was strong, 
almost bordering on a scream. Brooke replied quietly, Yes, I understand. She wasn't allowed to communicate with Jake directly, only through Gemma. Yeah, now go away, they ordered her. Just a few hours ago, Brooke was full of self-confidence, standing in front of the mirror. But now, her world has collapsed in less than an hour. Depressed, Brooke headed for her car, and Gemma sat down next to Jake and whispered to herself, Now you belong only to me. It's been so long, but we're finally reunited. Gemma stood up and pulled Jake after her. We need to practice, she said. Confused, Jake asked, Train for what? For number three, of course, she replied, giggling, and led him into the bedroom.